Can you see why? It's near control. So if I make the choice to not tell you the truth, I am actually controlling you. Because I feel you're not going to cope with the truth, right? So what am I making? I'm making a decision for you. I'm saying that you're not going to cope with the truth, so I'm not going to tell you it. I'm making a decision for you. And what am I doing? I'm harming your free will doing that. You have complete control over your life, which means that when you find out the truth, you have complete control and responsibility for everything you choose to do as a result of knowing that truth. And I'm not responsible for any of that. So this is why I've said, right, remember right back at the first time you met me, most of you, a lot of you, it was you low here in January, right? Mm -hmm. And I sat down with you, the first truth I need to tell you was who I am. Why did I have to do that? Because if we got to this stage, and then I started saying to you, oh, by the way, <laughs> I'm Jesus, how would you react to that? Wouldn't you feel duped and lied to and deceived and all these different feelings you would have? And in fact, you'd be justified in having them because I made a decision for you. I made it, if I had not told you then, I would, have, I would have made a decision for you that you couldn't cope with that. Right? That you couldn't cope emotionally with that truth. And in doing that, I'm in error. You follow me? And as soon as I'm in error, I'm, my connection with God's lost now. So it's very important for you to do the same thing. Stay in the truth at all times with all of your reactions and interactions. Yeah. I'm quite confused now because before when you were talking about when you told your mum, um, you know, you were saying your brother. Yeah. Because I also told my brothers something that had happened. Yep. And then my brothers went to my brother in law because he knew the truth too. Yep. But then they turned it all back on me. Yep. Like the one brother yep. who believes me yep. and understood everything. Yep. But these others weren't like, they couldn't even tell me, or they, they tried to stop me in my father's funeral. So, what's the emotion you're feeling? Do you want to come down and share it? You don't know if you can. You don't have to if you don't want to. What was your name? Christine. Christine. Christine's being very brave. So yeah, thanks. come on, Christine. <laughs> I, I had to go out before we came and yeah. was talking because yeah. there was a lot of rage. Yeah. Anger came up. Yeah. But that was for me towards my, my sons yeah. that I was feeling really bad. But then when you said something about your father, you had an abuse. And and of course, I shared that, you know, thinking, well, look, my brothers need to know really what happened because everyone's living this everyone's charade. Everyone's living a lie around you. Uh, uh, this charade. Okay. And I thought, you know, my sister was so just a beautiful person, but she's been dead about 10 years. Yeah. And then my mum died four and a half weeks later. So, of course, I was the only female left yeah. in the family. Yeah. And I felt, you know, they, they just, it was... This was before Dad died, yeah. and I mean, I didn't even know Dad was dying, but I felt to share it with them. And, yeah, and can, I say, can I say, firstly, you've done the right thing? Mm -hmm. Well, see, I was starting to feel like I'd done the wrong thing. Exactly. No, you've done the right thing by sharing it with them. That is now telling them the truth. And, and of course, then they've gone to my brother in law, and, and I got this email from him. Yeah. And I was just, I hadn't spoken since because I was shattered. Yeah. Because it was like. <laughs> They were sort of blaming me that I'm not coping with what had happened. In yeah. actual fact, I was I felt I was coping yeah. so well that I could speak the truth, truth. and yeah. say what had gone on, but now I've had no contact with these boys. So what's the emotion you're feeling now mostly? There's grief about Well it's sad because it was the most struggle I think that actually instigated a lot of this. Right. Because I did ask my brother not to tell her because I said I felt until it's Work through. It's yeah. it's a family thing, right. and I didn't want to. She probably, she thought a lot of my father, yeah. and I didn't want to shatter that for her. But my brother did share it with her, yeah. and I feel for my children because they've got no family, yeah. like no grandparents. They've got no. Yeah. They've just got no one. Yesterday was hard because I feel like if I die, they've got no one. Yeah. <laughs> and what to turn to? Not even their father. Yeah. It's, Close by and has nothing to do with them. So, yeah. it's, and so I ran into the bush this morning to work because I didn't want to confront yeah. half of this because I was too 
And it's beautiful. It's beautiful to feel it. Yeah. Yeah. And you need to just feel this. Now, what happens when we start telling the truth and facing the truth is the emotion starts flying, flowing. The emotional causes. So, for, for Christine now, what's actually happening is this beautiful process of all of these emotions that you've been holding on for all this time, you know, of like everyone living a lie around you and nobody being there for you, nobody feeling for you, and everyone, you know, you, all the ones that have loved you have left, basically, and there's no one who listens to you. All of those emotions, because you're telling the truth, are all now just coming up one after the other. And the key is to be brave enough now to actually, and have the courage now to actually experience those emotions. Do you follow me? Yeah. And that's what you're doing right now. And that's, that's, that's a really beautiful thing from God's perspective. Because now what you're doing is letting those emotions flow. And as those emotions flow out of you, what's happening is that you are now leaving space for God to, to, to begin feeling God's love into you. If you kept a hold on these emotions and didn't tell the truth, what would be happening is you'd be locking up all of these emotions. Because yeah, it was really tight yesterday, I was really sore. Yeah. And it was difficult sitting even yesterday. Yeah. And it's beautiful now that you're just letting yourself connect with those emotions. And my, my suggestion is, like, you don't even have to listen to the rest of the day, really. All you need to do is, <laughs> is just <laughs> let yourself feel what you're feeling right now. Because that's the whole goal of this, is to just connect with the truth and to experience it emotionally, just exactly what you're doing. Right? Nothing different than what you're doing. You're doing it exactly right. right. Now, everyone's response to you is their response. And people's response, by the way, is often going to be in error. Right? And if you have an expectation that it's going to be in truth, you're going to be severely disappointed in most cases. It's only after time, when they work through their emotions, that their response will be different. Right? Well, you think, you think even like when I first told you who I was, many of you went home in a really agitated state, right? And because there was all this stuff percolating up, and it took you time to work your way through that, even. And it's the same with what you, you've told your whole family huge truths, but in the doing that, you're facing them yourself, right? And in facing them yourself, your emotion is now flowing. And that's great. That's what it needs to happen. You see, it does sort of make it feel like I was, you know, wrong. And, and you're and, not. And, and that I was, you know, it just seemed like I was at fault. And, I, and then, of course, I started, but it had not been for my sister sharing. But these I are all causal emotions you truth. need to feel. That's yeah. good. You I know knew you? that it was the truth, that yeah. everything did happen as it happened, that it wasn't all in our In your heads. In our heads. Like you were brainwashing the feeling. Yeah. 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 It was just, I was just they're you know, really lovely people, but they just can't get through their own, their own... Yeah, but the truth is how... And again, I have to say this to everyone. You might be thinking your family are really lovely people and whatever else, but honestly... <laughs> lovely people face their own emotions. On that topic, do we choose our parents before we come here? No, they not? choose you. They choose us. Okay. So, so lovely people face their emotions. Do you understand that? Yes. Your best friends are not going to be your family if they're not facing their emotions. Mm. The people who are going to be, like I said, and this is something that I said quite often in the first century too, by the way. My father, my mother, and my sister, and my brother are those who follow the word of God and do it. Right? They are my parents, they are my sisters, they are my brothers. My family is only my family, really, if they follow my father's laws. Right? We have one parent, our father, God. Right? And she is our mother, and we need to understand that we are all just sisters and brothers, and if, if and the ones of us who are following those laws and following those principles are going to be the closest. So what you need to do is get some surrogate family, some surrogate family who are actually loving God's laws and who want to live in truth and who don't want to punish you for telling the truth. And you need to come to love them as your own family and help your children do the same. That's what you need to do. Because when you do that, you'll find that the real feelings that you have, the feelings that you have 
uh, you know, that'll trigger a lot of feelings about, you know, not having family, and it'll bring up a lot of issues as well, of course, in the process, which is very healing to you, and you need to grieve about those issues. But when you do that, what will happen is you will end up with this close group of people who you know love you for you, and who are brave enough to face any of their own emotions. That's what you end up with. And where do we find these people? My feelings are I know, but my feelings are that anyone who loves truth is automatically a friend. Mm -hmm. right? And I'm not saying I have any enemies, I'm just saying the ones that I feel the closest to are the people who are willing to emotionally experience their own truth. Right? And you'll find that too in your own life once you come to love truth automatically you'll start attracting people around you who seem to love truth as well. And you'll enjoy that so much. And, and there'll be some relationships you have that you'd never dream possible of having with people because you're all loving the truth. And it's beautiful that you're loving the truth. And it's beautiful that you're allowed to experience, and you're allowed to experience these emotions. These emotions have been locked up for a long time, eh? And it's beautiful that you're feeling them just <laughs> If you're taking an action out of need, or out of fear, or out of a desire to get something from someone, if you're taking any of those actions, then what you're actually doing is not loving them. So I'm not suggesting that you take those actions. But I am saying to you that if you take the action out of love, you will always want to express the truth in any given situation. So that means you will never avoid the truth. You will never <coughs> run away from the truth. You will never try to make the truth seem what it isn't. Right? And you will explain the truth to people who may be confused. Now, your father, your real father, is afraid to face the truth of his own action. Mm -hmm. Alright? So, if he was my father, I'd be sitting down with him saying, Dad, you're afraid to face the truth of the fact that I'm your child. Now, while that's the case, it's very, very hard for me to compromise with you and have a relationship. Mm. Face the truth that I'm your child right, in your life. And then we can have a full relationship where I'm not feeling bad for the, your other children because I'm worried about what they're going to think of me going out with you to have dinner. Right? face the truth of that relationship. Now, I'm not at that if you're doing that, you're not pressuring them to do anything. You're just saying that you need to face your own truth and that is is my dad really loving me while he denies me? Now, for most of you, most of you put up with people denying you, right? Because if you face the truth of that, you might have to leave them and you don't want to leave them because it all feels secure and whatever else. All right? But the truth is, if somebody is denying you, denying your emotions, are they really loving you? Right? They're not. Now, I'm not saying that you have to then need them to do all of this. You, but you need to, at some point, ask yourself, why am I allowing this situation to occur that's not in truth? 
and it's always a fear. But I'm the one that sought him out. He didn't. Immaterial. Honestly. Coming to his life, I feel like I've taken that bit of relationship with him. <coughs> so now you're justifying his behavior. Mm -hmm. And it's not until you ask for your needs that you can actually then come up with a truth, to like a, or a boundary, or a truth for yourself that you will do when you will continue a relationship or leave yeah, a relationship. I, I don't feel them as boundaries or anything like that. All I do is feel what? If I loved myself, what would I do here? Mm -hmm. And if I loved myself in your situation, I would want an open relationship, a truthful relationship with my father. The Four o'clock, it's ten past. Oh, I don't know what to do with this. Give us all detention. It's hard, hard to go to a free place to get detention. It's enough to punish everybody. Yeah, I, I'm into punishment actually. <laughs> I think, I think I'll punish you by withdrawal, a silent treatment. <laughs> ten, ten minutes silent treatment. <laughs> and one thing I would like to do is just talk to you about uh, some emotional projections I've been receiving while I've been talking about truth. Is that alright? Well, it's too bad if it isn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> One strong emotion coming from some of you is this feeling that when I'm speaking of truth, that you're feeling I'm judging you. And so many of you have this feeling of being judged when I'm talking about truth. Now, I don't feel that emotion about this subject with anyone. All right? so, so if you're feeling that feeling of judgment, look within yourself. Because what you will find is that it's driven by an emotion of personal shame. So in other words, there's times in your life where you have been untruthful and you feel that my comments are judging those times. You follow me? Yeah. And because you feel that judgment, that what I'm saying is a judgment, then I get a projection of anger or resistance back from you. All right? So if you can own that, if you can see that you're judging yourself in reality, you're actually being ashamed, you're feeling guilt or shame about being, you know, not telling your truth or not being in truth through different events in your life. And you can re-look at those events and just ask yourself, well, what emotions am I feeling? If I'm feeling shame, then there's unresolved emotions that I feel attached to those events. Let yourself feel those unresolved emotions attached to those events. And what will happen inside of you then is you won't feel that I'm judging you when I'm speaking the truth to you. Does that make sense to everyone? And uh, that will also help me with my voice closing up because I'm responding to a uh, worthiness issue. Because <laughs> when I get this projection of judgment back at me that I'm, you know, this projection of anger, my, my feeling is I need to start shutting down now and just walking away. That's the feeling that I get sometimes. And I'm just trying to fight that. So I've got this, this congestion in my throat as a result of that. Does that make sense? Yes. So I've got an emotion to work through with that as well. Yeah. Alright, well let's go back to uh, some of these qualities of divine truth, shall we? We were down to uh, only the fourth one, actually. <laughs> it's progressing really well. <laughs> divine truth, with all its power and knowledge, will not compel a man to accept itself with it, with, against his will. Do you understand what I mean by that? What I mean is that no matter how much in a truthful place you are, you will never want to force another person to be in that same place. And if you feel like you want to force another person to be in the same place, you are not in a space of love. You follow me? So how many times do you say to yourself, oh, I wish my husband would do that, <laughs> or I wish my wife would do that? You are actually out of harmony with divine truth when you do that. Right? Because what you're actually saying is that you wanting, you're having a feeling that they should be compelled in some way to deal with their stuff. And what is God's feeling? They have free will. They're allowed to hold on to their stuff and feel its pain as long as they want. Right? This is one of the reasons why religions go to war. 
So is that in harmony with divine truth? No. Obviously not. So would a you know would a person with a certain religious belief actually be in harmony with love if they decide to actually compel another person with a different religious belief to change their mind? And do you even really change a person's mind like that? I don't think so. Uh, gun to your head, change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'll blow it away. <laughs> right? That's really what's happening, isn't it? A lot of times, and the, the spirit passes in that condition. And what are they feeling? They're feeling more anger, more rage, more disharmony with the person who was just trying to compel them. You will never want to compel another person against their will once you're in harmony with divine truth. So when I'm saying to things like, I said the truth to my brother, I didn't say it so that he has to accept it. I said it because I love the truth and the truth is the principle. I'm not compelling him to accept it. And for three years he didn't. And that's okay too. And he can try to punish me for that for three years. That's okay too. So you pretty much say it and leave them with it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. The truth is such a powerful, beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. You'll find this in your own life. The moment you start telling yourself the truth, emotions will just flow. You know, one after the other after the other. You'll wonder where, it, where how you started this whole, whole process of emotional flow. You know, and it, and it all begins just from saying the truth. Um, I confess, I find social interaction quite difficult because even with simple things. I will say what I think I believe or I do believe at that particular moment and then have sometimes quite quickly a realisation, uh-oh, that, that's not exactly right. But the other person who's received that got what I believe at that particular moment and then I've had a realisation that yep. that's not exactly right and I want to get it right. Yeah. What? Deal with that when you're you're seeking to do the right thing, you're seeking to go with divine truth, you're seeking towards, but you're also dealing with your own error and you're dealing with your own frailty for one of a better way of thinking. Well, one one thing about truth is that truth allows you to make mistakes. In fact, down uh, down in the list somewhere, uh, where is it? <coughs> The individual's knowledge of divine truth is eternally progressive. Right? In other words, you're going to always... This is on page 3, top of page 3. And related to that, personal truth is always eternally progressive. Now, if we have a feeling that, oh, I knew a truth today, today I had a huge realisation, and tomorrow my truth is totally different. This is going to happen to you all the time, right? Yes. And then you feel like now you've got to go back and correct all the times <laughs> when, when you didn't know the truth, right? And, and so what that creates, that is driven by a fear inside of you that you're not allowed to make mistakes. Every single one of you is allowed to make mistakes. Because guess what? You're not God. You're not God. <laughs> You're allowed to make mistakes too, AJ. Yeah, I'm allowed to make mistakes. Right? And that's one of the things I had to come to terms with, is I'm allowed to make mistakes. And you have to come to terms with the fact you're allowed to make mistakes. And you're allowed to be in error today and in more truth tomorrow. And whatever happened error today was the result... Whatever happened to you today, the results of the law of compensation, the law of, law of attraction, was already correcting you today so that you could arrive at a new truth tomorrow. You understand? There's no, you, know, you don't have to go back and pay for it all now, but you will feel certain compulsions decided with a new truth. So, for instance, uh, all of you have heard of Luther, right? The right? founder of the Lutheran religion. Luther, when he was on earth, told some truths, and he also taught people some untruths. Right? Now, when he passed into the spirit world, a lot of, by the way, a lot of the untruths were about women. He, he was quite, um, he had quite some negative viewpoints about women. Do you realise this? No? 
And a lot of people don't realise how negative he was. <laughs> and a lot of those truths had to be corrected, right, once he passed. And what's an example of what he said? Oh, he said that uh, a woman's only good for the home um, and to satisfy the man, a man's sexual needs. And he believed that quite strongly. So he had some very, um, very strong chauvinistic beliefs. He had some very strong racial prejudices as well. And he's now my, by the way, he's a spirit friend of mine in the celestial kingdom. He's in the, he's in the spheres above the eighth sphere. Now, what he had to do was come to terms with the fact that firstly he had taught large groups of people untruth. So let's say you realise you've taught all of these people untruth and then you come to a new knowledge of truth. What are you want to go, going to want to do? Yeah. Of course you want to correct that, don't you? So one of the things he feels he wanted to do was to correct some of the untruths. And he has been trying to do that through channeling and through other things. I'm confused. Did he know he was saying untruths at the time? Like well, no, he found was, At the time, that was his truth. That, at the mm. time, was so his truth. Because yeah. you've got me here as well with the, um, the personal truth is limited. Yes. So but then it's progressive. So is it limited today that it can progress tomorrow? Um, it's limited in the sense that it's never going to be God's. It's never going to be infinite. So, so your your truth is limited to what you can understand right at this moment. In that way, it's limited. It can expand, and it will always be eternally progressive, right? In the sense that it will grow and grow and grow and grow if you remain open to divine truth. Your limited personal truth will grow into a new state and then into a new state. But at any one point, it's not <coughs> infinite. It's always yeah, limited. Mould at, at this point and what you said earlier, I have the, <coughs> an understanding that my personal truth can grow into being divine truth. Yes. In which then my personal truth in conjunction with divine truth can be infinite. No, it can't. It can't. No. Okay. Um, be aware that I'm saying that only God has divine <laughs> truth. And only God has the infinite divine truth. So in other words, every single tiny little detail of this universe is in God. That will never be in you. Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah. You follow me? Yeah. But you can grow to know more and more and more and more and more by of that, allowing that by allowing that divine love to flow through you and therefore allowing the education to get be received by God. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But you will never be God in the sense that you, you can yeah, never know yeah. exactly what God knows. <clears throat> Does everyone understand what I'm saying with that? You will never know exactly what God knows, but you will eternally progress towards what God knows. And that's why, like, in the, like there's a verse in the Bible, in Ecclesiastes 3 of 11, saying, um, God has put eternal life into your heart so that you will never find out what the true God has done. In other words, you're going to seek for the rest of your existence truth, and you'll never find out its complete beauty. But every single new thing you find out is just going to emotionally overwhelm you. Right? And that's the beauty. Yeah, so you never reach the end. You never reach the end. So, but, but your truth will grow through that process. But at any one point, compared to the infinite divine truth available to you, it is still limited. You follow me? Yeah. So that's what I mean by that. My pleasure. Um, let's have a look at some of these others. Um, uh, fourth one down on page two. Divine truth results in freedom. The truth will set you free. Alright? A lot of people don't really believe this, right? What do a lot of people really believe? The truth gets you in trouble. The truth gets you in trouble. Right? The truth doesn't set you free for most people. The truth they feel creates more burdens. But it's not truth that creates burdens, it's error that creates burdens. The divine truth really sets you free completely. And that's why I've said there that because they free you from error, they also free you from pain. Because remember, error is a cause of all pain. All emotional error is a cause of my emotional pain. And also, even in your personal life, divine truth can result in freedom. For example, let's say a woman is being abused in her life, in a relationship, right? What's the truth she's not accepting? 
that she's worthy of more. Exactly. Yeah. She's not accepting or the truth. Or just loving herself and not allowing to live in that sort of thing. She's not accepting the truth that her husband who's saying, I love you, is actually, and it's not, I love you. Right? Because it's all just nothing where it's coming out of his mouth if he's abusing her. And she's not accepting the truth that he doesn't love her. Can you see that? Yeah. Now, because she doesn't accept the truth that he doesn't love her, she stays in a trapped relationship. So she's what she's done is she's placed these bars around her life of all the emotions she doesn't want to experience. And what's one of these emotions is, I'm unworthy of love. Right? So she places these bars around her, and she's made a cage for herself. And because she's unwilling to face the truth, which is like destructing the cage, she remains in this state, this stagnant and trapped state. But as soon as she starts facing the truth, she realizes in a sec, anybody who physically is violent towards me can't love me. It's impossible right, for them to be loving me. No matter what word is coming out of their mouth, they are not loving me. <coughs> right? And once she emotionally feels that he doesn't love me, she'll go through a huge emotion, won't she? She'll cry maybe for days or you know, a few days. And it might even connect it to some emotions <coughs> from her childhood of her father not loving her. And she'll cry her way through that. And why wasn't I worthy to be loved by my father? And all those kind of issues will start coming up, right? If she allows them. Once she's worked through all of that issue, what does she feel then? I'm lovable. And at that instant, she realises that I don't need to stay in this relationship anymore. I'm worth more than this. And she leaves. Right? So what does it have to truth created for her? Freedom. 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 That's what truth does, even in your personal life, if you accept it. All right? Divine truth, God's truth, creates this <coughs> huge freedom. What will happen in the end is you can be able to express your free will in this awesome way that is totally unimaginable to you at the moment. And it will all be because you've lived in this state of truth and now your free will is able to be expressed completely. That's what divine truth does for you. It frees you completely. The next one. Divine truth results in a fearless existence. So any religious viewpoint that creates more fear right, or terror in you, like hellfire, like the teaching, I am eternally tormented for anything that I do on earth here. I have to pay for it in the spirit world. Common Christian belief, is it not? <laughs> How many of you have been terrified of it as a child? <coughs> right? Lots of you would have been terrified as a child if you've been brought up with that belief. Any belief that creates that kind of terror is not God's truth. I don't care if it's written in the Bible or the Koran or any other holy book. If it creates that Fear, it is not God's truth. Right? That's how it is. So look really sincerely at beliefs that you're, that you're getting referred to. Example in a lot of religions is, if you don't do what we say, then you will be excommunicated from us. Now, what is that creating? Fear. And it's also saying that you're limited to our viewpoint. Would God ever say that to you? So it can't be divine. Because how are you ever going to learn a bit of the infinite truth if you're limited to your viewpoint? You're never going to learn infinite truth doing that, are you? So if truth is infinite, then it makes sense also that, that anything that I need to accept is going to expand from yesterday to today to tomorrow and, and so forth. Doesn't it? So if I'm having to feel at the moment that I'm locked in into a certain religious belief and if I stay in this religious belief what will happen is that I will actually have to, you know, if I, if I don't stay in it I will have to be excommunicated from the church or I'll be treated badly by them or whatever else then there's issues of truth and there's issues of how I love myself involved in that transaction. You so, so in the, if you wanted to read the Bible, because I actually looked at pictures of the Bible when I was a child and yep. meant they were so scary I just didn't ever want to open up the Bible ever again. Yeah. Ever again stabbed and all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, and also that it's not all truths and and some you know. But I've, I've always wanted to have a look through it, but I but I don't because yeah. of that. I so read it. Read it from this perspective. Okay. 
anything that's in there that prevents God as a punishing God, as a fearsome God, as a, they're all just men's ideas. They're not anything about God whatsoever. Anything that presents, prevents, presents God as a God of love, God of care, and so forth, mercy, forgiveness, kindness, and all those kind of qualities, they're all truths. <coughs> Let yourself listen to those, because there's some beautiful things that the Bible says about all of those things. <coughs> like, my whole life was in the, in the first century was formed by what I read in the Hebrew scriptures of the Bible um, from those things, from the psalmists and the prophets and all of those. So there's some really beautiful... I, like, I have a deep attachment to a lot of those writings because of how much it affected my life. So allow yourself, allow yourself to, uh, to connect emotionally to what mm -hmm. you're actually feeling from the material. Yeah. Hey Jay, in the first century, how did you, if you learned from those, how did you discern then which were the truths? Because there would have been some untruths. When God's love is flowing through you, as soon as you, you can ask questions of God like, and get responses, right? And you'll feel a resonance in your soul. The, the, the ones that resonate, you bring you to tears. So the truths that will resonate with you when, you when you're reading something will bring you to a place of, of, of you know, probably crying, being overwhelmed emotionally every single time. So every new truth that you receive from God, if it's resonating with, the God, with God's love and opens up your connection further, you'll feel this overwhelming emotional experience and you'll know in your heart that it's true. You won't need anybody to tell you either. But in the end what will happen is all of you at some point, and many of you might not believe this at the moment, but all of you at some point, once you become at one with God, will all believe the same thing. Yeah. Mm. Right? Not because you trusted me or trusted somebody else to tell you it, but because you have experienced it. And so you know it to be true. Yeah. Right? The next one I think is a really interesting one because it's common belief. The truth does not hurt anyone or anything. <clears throat> so why am I in pain when I tell the truth? <laughs> What's happening? Are you yeah. feeling the other person's emotions? Not usually. <laughs> if I'm in pain, I'm feeling my own emotions generally. <laughs> Should Should letting go of, uh, of all beliefs. Of the error. Yeah. All error creates terrible, terrible emotions. Like all of the emotions you feel that you are trying to run away from have all been created by error. By emotions that you believe to be true but that have entered you inside of your heart. And when they come out of you, they feel like pulling out like barbs, arrows out of you. There is so much <coughs> emotional pain associated with the error leaving you. And when the Apostle John was living on earth, he, he had this illustration passed to him from a spirit of, he had a dog, his dog was called Sandy, and little Sandy was a little Jack Russell. And he had this dream one night where Sandy had been shot with barbs all over her, and she was, had all these arrow-headed barbs all sticking into her. And what would John do with all these arrows sticking into Sandy? Now, he could just shoot the dog, but it's not a very loving act, is it? If he loves the dog, what would he do is he'd pull out each one, wouldn't he? Mm -hmm. But then he'd have to, like, each one is going to be painful coming out of her, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Each one, pull out one, she'd be whimpering and crying and feeling all these emotions, you know, feeling all these feelings. Mm -hmm. Then pull out another and she'd feel all these feelings of pain and hurt and all that, and they would pass and you'd pull out another. And that's exactly what God's doing to you. God is trying to pull out all of these emotional errors out of you. Right? And he's trying to do it in the most loving, caring possible way. But all emotional errors hurt. And when they release from you, and the only way they release is by you being in truth, it hurts. But it's not the truth that's hurting you. You understand? It's the emotional error leaving you that's hurting you. Me last night because I had heart attack pains. Yeah. <laughs> Nearly in the ambulance and the whole bit. Yeah. So that's an emotional, emotional release happening. The key is to, they're all caused by grief. Yeah. So the key now is to connect more to that grief because there's more there 
So, so allow yourself to connect to that grief and experience that grief. Right? And then as you do that, you'll find that the feelings will de de intensify. You know, they'll go down. Thank yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And you notice I've mentioned a few things like, uh, how many of you have been asked, see you later, how many of you have been asked, oh, am I overweight? <laughs> do you think I'm overweight? And, and what do you say to the person, particularly if it's a lady asking the question? <laughs> you see, what happens with those kind of questions is, what is the person really wanting? Reassurance. They're wanting lies, yeah. They want lesbian lies. They want lies because they do not want to feel the truth. So it, it, it's alright if I would say, yeah, yeah, you want, you're fine, yes, it's okay? No. No. The truth is, what do you feel? <coughs> is the person overweight? Do you but feel the person is? You say we should accept, you know, everybody has different opinion. Oh, yeah. yeah. But you're allowed your opinion too. Oh, okay. And if I'm asked my opinion, mm -hmm. then I'm allowed to give it. Do I, like if a lady comes up and she's overweight, and I say, well, yes, you are overweight. Do you know why? <laughs> it's because of this shame emotion that you're holding on to that's affecting this area here, and it's, and it's this. Do you know what I mean? Like, we can talk about that then, can't we? Right? Like, you will find as you deal with your emotions, your weight will just fall off you. It will. You're holding on to emotion. You're holding on to weight because you're holding on to emotions if, if you're feeling overweight. Let's be honest about it. Right? There's all these taboo subjects, isn't there? Like the like. question, yes, it's the same. So historically, what have you been told? It's not kind to say that. But what's the kindest thing? The kindest thing is to trigger the emotion inside of a person to help them release it so they no longer hold on to it anymore. That's the kindest thing. about fashion? Yes, everybody has, you know, different style, dress yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. And we can have different opinions on that, you know. Of course. Yeah, how could I say, you know, oh, no, you dressed awful, you know. Oh. Well, you can say, it's my opinion, you're dressing awful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you don't have to take my opinion. No, that's okay. And to be honest with you, if I had some self-worth and self-love, I wouldn't even care to ask you for your opinion <laughs> about how I'm dressing. Okay. Do, it's do a, it's okay to soften the edge a little bit, though, surely. You know, yeah. you could say to the person, is it, is it, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and be quite honest as well. Because if the person's wearing all the wrong colours together, you can say, well, they're not colours that I would wear, but if you're happy with those colours, then yes, they're, they're, they're fine. Then that would be truthful, but it would still be saying that I don't really like those colours together. No, you're not really saying that. Yes, I do. No, you're not. They're not, not what I would choose for myself. So say that. So, it is. Because I don't that. think that they would suit me. But why not tell her the truth? She's asked you for her opinion. Tell her the truth of how you feel. Why not tell her the truth? Because you know why? Because you're afraid of her emotional response. Yes, I don't. And if you're basing your response on fear, what are you doing? Are you loving the person if you're basing response on fear? No, you're not. All right. So, and this is what gets back to the previous comment I made. You want to embellish the truth. You want to make it more comfortable and more palatable. Honestly, you've got no idea if you feel that way because. From God's perspective, the truth is already the most beautiful thing she has created. The truth is what sets you free. It's the most beautiful thing God has created. You can't embellish it. You can think you can, but you're really just thinking that you're better than God. That's all you're feeling. The truth is, the truth being stated exactly as you feel it right in that instant is exactly the thing the person who's asking you the question needs. Mm -hmm. Deep down, that person's actually worried about it, so they're actually seeking yeah, the truth. Yeah. They, yeah, deep down, they're worried about it. They're seeking their addiction to be satisfied. And what you're doing by telling them the truth is not satisfying their addiction and allowing them to connect with the emotion, which is the thing that's going to lead them closer <coughs> to God. All right? So by speaking, speaking the truth in every single instance, what you're actually doing is you're helping the person to actually connect to the emotional resistances they have with God every single time and you can't embellish that you can't make it better than it is the truth is just so beautiful that eventually you'll come to just love it for itself and that's even the truth of your own opinion 
And you're allowed your own opinion. Even when you're a celestial spirit, you're going to be allowed to have your own opinion. So another celestial spirit comes along and says, you reckon I look pretty cool today? Like, no. Nah, not right, baby. You, know, you can wear what you want. That's fine. All right. You'll have no trouble with that. That's called variety. And if you would accept variety, but it's not what you need to accept, right? You don't want it. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that you're not loving the person. And if they have an emotional response to your comment, what's the issue? Then when you're approving. Exactly. They're wanting or needing something from you. Right? And if you give it to them, what are you doing? You're just mm -hmm. enabling mm -hmm. them to stay in, away from the feeling that they have just attracted for you to treat them. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing. Is there any space not to say anything at all? Certainly, there are times when, like I said uh, in the first century, uh, that it's pointless to cast per pearls before swine. And I wasn't judging people by that. What I was actually saying was that if a person is rejecting truth already, it's pointless for you to actually tell them more. Do you follow me? Right? Why bother casting more pearls of wisdom, which is all to do with truth, when the person's already rejected the ones you've just given them. I find this happening a lot in interactions in groups. Like somebody will ask me a question and I give them the answer. And then somebody asks me, no, but I don't think you understand what I was asking. And then they ask me a question in a different way. And I give them the same answer. And then they, don't, they say, no, no, I don't think you understand. What, what's really happening here? They want a different truth than what I've given them. That's all. And so what do I have to do then? I've just got to stop. I've got to stop. You don't want to accept my answer. That's fine. You're allowed to not accept my answer. That's fine too. But I'm just telling you the truth. And you can do exactly the same. You don't have to tell the truth constantly to people over and over and over again if they're rejecting it already. But give them the opportunity to reject it or accept it. And the only reason why we don't in most cases is because we are too afraid to experience our own emotions about their rejection. So it's a heartfelt intention. You have a heartfelt intention to be of service in truth. <clears throat> and that's it. A heartfelt intention to live in love, which also means living in truth. I mean God's truth. Divine love, divine truth. Okay. A heartfelt intention to live in those spaces. <clears throat> when you have a heartfelt intention to live in those spaces, you won't be afraid of what other people feel about your truth. And if you are afraid, you will realise that there's an emotion inside of you that has yet to actually come to understand truth. Right. So all of us at some point feel afraid about truth, don't we? Mm -hmm. like some of you get into a state where it's... <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know if I can say this right. Because <laughs> you know even what the response is probably going to be in many cases, don't you? Right? You have this feeling, oh, the response is going to be this or the response is going to be that. And you sometimes don't know whether that's just your feeling or whether you know the person so well that you know they're going to respond a certain way, right? But honestly, in most cases, if you can just allow yourself to say the truth, whatever is in your heart, emotionally, will come out. Whatever is in their heart, emotionally, that's still locked up, will come out. And you'll have a much more truthful existence. And do you see a place like... I, I think the way we treat children is the way we should treat ourselves and our friends. You know, like if, if it was a child we'd tell them the truth to, and it was di a difficult truth for a child, we would maybe sit them down and be gentle. Always. We, yeah, and I think it's really important to think, okay, this may be a difficult truth for a friend, but I have an obligation, a, a loving obligation, to to be to, to prepare them, not not by softening the blow. I don't, I don't mean in a weak sense or by weakening it, but by actually consciously making sure we can, we can be gentle. But if I'm coming from a but if I'm coming from a loving space already, I'm automatically gentle, yeah. right? But be, don't confuse gentleness with 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 weakness, though either, because the truth is a very powerful thing. It will have a huge powerful effect on people that you tell it to, right? And you, like honestly, I've sat down with people with my arm around them and told them the truth, and for the next six months they haven't spoken to me, right? So what didn't they feel? Love. They didn't feel the love I felt for them telling the truth. All they felt was this big emotional resonance, bang, and then off. 
and they can't handle that truth because they don't want to feel the underlying emotion. That's all they're it is. They're the ones you call swine, Major. Sorry? They're the ones you call swine. No, no, I was, I was, I was used in the, a lot of metaphors, right? In the, uh, and a lot of metaphors in, in the language I was using at the time is uh, where had double, all the words had double meanings. Yeah. Like wind had a similar meaning to spirit and so all these different words and swine has double meaning with other words as well. So, you know, there were all these double meaning words that I used. And again, the reason why I did that was because back then, if you said anything nice and straight and direct like I'm saying it to you now, most people just get angry and want to shoot you. Well, you can. <laughs> right? You. And so what I had to do is create a way back then in, way in which people could actually hear what I was saying and had to think about it first, right? Without responding <laughs> straight away. <laughs> yeah, that's right, basically. And so, and so back then, a lot of a lot of the things I'm saying to you very directly now, I would have had to say back then in a way that caused you to go. Oh, what he meant by that, you know? Was he getting at me? Was he, he get away. was he joking with me or was he serious or what? Yeah. Whereas now, because more and more people are used to plain, direct speaking, it's a lot easier to give that plain, direct truth without having to um, put it in metaphors. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And you'll find that you'll do the same with people as you... you know, at the start, you might have an illustration that you give them and, and that hope that they get it. But after a while, once the person's really wanting truth in their heart, you will be able to just say it straight as it is. Right? So you'll be able to say, you know, the feeling I'm getting from you is that you just, you know, you just don't love your husband at all, actually. That's the feeling I'm getting from you. you know? And you'll be able to say that. And you'll also be able to accept that you might be wrong. Right? You won't feel you won't feel bad if you're wrong. Hey Jenny, is it good to give like you know I have sort of some perceptions about a friend which I feel I think is fairly accurate, but she's not asking me for them, so there's no no point in me really giving them, is there? Um the area of this is I suppose if there is any grey area in the terms of how we feel about things generally, is that we, when we when a person not asking for it, we then go down the track of saying well, I don't know if I should really give it to them. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing I feel about truth is this. How does a person ever find out the truth if they don't know the truth in the first place? <coughs> like, if nobody comes along and actually volunteers yeah. to give it to them. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, pretty, it's very hard to get in there. I know I should be incredibly upset. Right, so really it's a fear, but within you, you firstly yeah, need to feel. Yeah, about our friendship. Yeah. About losing the friendship. My feelings about friendship are this. When I love the person as much, you know, completely, I will actually never be afraid of losing their friendship, ever. Right? So obviously, if I'm afraid of losing their friendship, there's yet my love for them <coughs> yet to be completed. And it usually is yet to be completed because of an emotion that I have within myself. Mm. So I'm afraid of losing their friendship. I like certain parts of their friendship and if they get upset with me, I don't get that anymore. I feel like I'm going to lose something precious. There's a lot of issues like that that are revolving around our telling the truth. But it's still our responsibility to offer that when you feel it is a truth. I'm not saying it's your responsibility. I'm not forcing you to offer it. What I'm saying is it an, is an act of love to offer it. Do you, you, everyone follows what I'm saying there. It's an act of love to offer the truth to somebody else, even if they're not at, asking for it at that moment. Right? It's an act of love to offer it, in love. And so I wouldn't go and tell her in an angry spirit, because that's not offering it in love. Right? I'd have to offer it in love to a person. And like nobody, usually every one of us needs help to find truth, right? That's generally the case. All of us need help to find the truth. So what we need to do is come to like the interchange with people that exposes our truth. We come to love that. Now, if I love a person enough, I won't, I'll be willing to risk my friendship with them for the sake of their happiness. I had a, can I just share an experience I had this morning, exactly what you're saying there, and it's something that you said yesterday about... Um, um, 
there's no perfect time. We're going to start dealing with our stuff, processing our stuff, no matter where we are. Yeah. I have a friend whose mother's recently died, and every time I run into her, it just comes out of my mouth. I say something about her mother, forgetting that her mother's died. Just died. Yeah. And I said to her today, I realised that, oh, I'm doing this every time, and I thought, this is happening because she obviously needs to deal with some more stuff about her mother. And so I brought it to her attention. Yeah. And, and I was saying that to her quietly, I said, look, at the moment, blah, 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 and this is going to keep coming out of my mouth, and this is the way it is. And she said, oh, you know, I don't want to deal with this right now. And I just, I didn't say anything after that. And within about three minutes, everyone at the table started looking at her bracelet and went, oh my God, that's the most beautiful bracelet. Where did you get that? And it was, the, it was something that her mother had left her and it was just so in her face. Yeah. And, but they hadn't heard anything that we had said. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And nor had she. No. Honestly, <laughs> no. Yeah, from no. in her heart. Yeah. No. yeah. And it's a, isn't it funny how, like, at every, you'll find it in your own life, that every single situation you attract is there to actually expose that emotion that you're ready to experience. Yeah. Otherwise, you wouldn't be attracted. And we often say, oh, I'm not ready <laughs> for that. But the truth is, ah, like, you wouldn't be attracting it if you aren't ready for it. So you're attracting it already, experience it. Um, I've had experience with a couple of guys that have got sort of like sexually predative kind of behaviour. Yep. And I'm just wondering if like, it's taking away their free will to have an experience with a woman, even if it's abusive, like, so they can learn. If I go and warn a woman not to be with them because they're not very nice. You, the experience you've had of sexual predative behaviour yeah. is due to your law of attraction. There's an emotion from your childhood about men and their behaviour yeah. that you are yet to release. Okay. When you release that emotion, what will happen is you will no longer attract men who are predators sexually. Yeah. The, in, in terms of protecting other people about it, mm -hmm. well, that is your choice or your decision. Bear in mind there's also a law of attraction at work in every case. Yeah, so you can, can you can tell a thousand women, and those thousand women, if there's 500 of them, or three, even probably one, not that many, but if there's like 50 of them who are attracting that kind of behaviour, they will still attract them, unless they are fully willing to experience that emotion. Yeah. So, yeah, it's the emotion, remember, that solves all the problems? Experiencing it is the thing that solves all the problems. That's the truth. Let's go on to some next one. <clears throat> oh, by the way, I just wanted to say on this lies thing. There are emotional penalties on your soul for wanting to believe a lie. <laughs> and the emotional penalty is always painful. Right? So when you want to believe a lie, you are actually... So, you know, some people say, do you want to know if your husband cheated on you today? How many people would put up their hand and say, no, not really, I don't want to know. A lot actually do that. Right? Now, why, don't they, why do they want to believe a lie? <coughs> they won't have to deal with the emotion. And you, Can you see the link? If you want to believe a lie, you don't want to deal with the emotion. And when you don't want to deal with an emotion, there's an automatic penalty. You're making a choice that's going to result in pain. You follow me? Right? Every time you make a choice that's going to result in pain, and we often do this, we're actually not loving our soul. Right. It's an interesting thought when you think about it. Alright, divine truth does not allow the lie no matter what the price. Um, who's been in a position where their husband or wife has cheated on them? And there are people around them that knew, and nobody told them. Have any of you been in that position? Yeah, quite a few, eh? Hey? How did that feel? Betrayed was out. Yeah, total betrayal of, of friends and so forth, isn't it? It just felt really bad. Now, bear in mind that you attracted it. <laughs> so there's some issues to work your way through emotionally. Right? But what I'm saying is that if I'm a friend of a person and I see her husband cheating on her with somebody else, if I love her in my heart, and if I love him in my heart, I would firstly go to him, wouldn't I, and say, 
you need to be open and truthful. Right? And not because of any other... I'm not forcing you to be. I'm just saying, if you're not open and truthful, I'm going to be open and truthful because that's my responsibility to God, to be open and truthful. Right? And I will stay in that truth. And so when he gets angry and upset with me, that's too bad. I'm going to stay in this truth, no matter what the price. I'm going to lose your friendship, that's too bad. I'm sad about that, but... And if you are sad about it, have a cry. But I'm, I'm, nowadays I'm not sad about that anymore, right? Because once you cry out all those emotions, once you feel the grief of people losing friendships because they don't want to be in truth, then that emotion is free from you. And you don't worry about that anymore. It's, it's not a part of you anymore. And so you would say the truth also to your friend, right? <laughs> How many of you feel that you shouldn't say anything to your friend? It's their business. Yeah. I suppose too, people have the fear that it will backfire and they'll end up still together and you just look like the idiot that tried to... So what do you learn in that process? That they're not ready to hear the truth. Exactly. And are they going to be good friends if they can't hear the truth? No. Okay. And you need to go through that emotion of feeling the loss of good friends because you spoke the truth. Do you follow me? There's an emotion that's going to come up there. Right? So I've lost many good friends about speaking the truth. Right? People who I, I've loved. Right? But obviously they didn't love the truth. Do you follow me? Yeah. And how are you ever going to be a permanent friend to somebody who hasn't got this permanent connection with God wanting truth? In the end it's going to fluctuate, ebb and flow, isn't it? So, so one moment they'll be in truth, Everything will be fine. Then they'll get into some error. And if you're both, you know, one of you is in error, then obviously everything's not going to be fine in that period of time. And then they'll get back into truth and come back to you later on. Who's had that happen? Mm -hmm. They've told somebody something, they've got really upset, worked through it emotionally, and then come back afterwards. Mm -hmm. right? That means that they have learnt some of the lessons of truth yeah, and faced some of those emotions. But the truth never allows a lie, not knowingly. Do you know what I mean? So if you know somebody is lying right now and you allow them to continue doing it, and I don't mean you allow them in the sense of like you've got control over them, I mean you allow the lie itself to continue unopposed. You follow me? So I'm not talking about opposing the person. I'm not talking about judging the person. I'm just <coughs> saying the lie itself is an object in its own right. It's an emotion now being passed through all of your surroundings, all through your environment. And what do emotions of lies create? Pain. They all create pain. You follow me? The only, it's only the emotions based around truth and love that create bliss. So every time you allow the lie, this <coughs> object called a lie, to exist, you are allowing, in fact, pain to exist. And the key is to see that. Yeah, wouldn't it, like, you know, get back to that if you saw a friend having a relationship with somebody else? Yep. Wouldn't it be more, more important that you go to the person having a relationship and say, look, I can't have this relationship with you while you're doing this? I mean, is it really your part to go and tell their wife or their husband? Is it really your part to do that? Well, your first comment is spot on. Of course you'd go to the person who's doing the act and say, look, I don't feel we can have a truthful relationship while you're not having truthful relationships yourself. So obviously if you're willing to lie to your wife, you're certainly willing to lie to me. So, you know, I don't feel that we can have a truthful relationship. But in the end, like, would, would even a loving space be to reject the person under no matter what they're doing? So I'm not talking about rejecting the person. I'm just talking about saying the truth. Right, so I would never go to a person and say, oh, I'm not going to be your friend because you're doing this. Yeah. That's a judgment, isn't it? It's a judgment and it's also a condemnation and a rejection. And I, why, why would I want to do that? All I want to do is go to them and say, look, you're not telling the truth. And I'm, I'm here because I, like, I love the truth. And as your friend, I, I love you so much that I'm willing to tell your truth to everyone. People get really upset with me. <laughs> because they feel nothing's private. <laughs> And uh, yeah, that's a big, that is a big issue. 
Honestly, in the spirit world, nothing is private. Nothing. Did you not think that at the moment every single skeleton in your closet is known by actually thousands of people if they wanted to know? Every single spirit in this room knows every single skeleton in your closet. Huh? Right from the ones who are still practicing evil, right to the ones who are celestial and are in a state of love. They all know your skeleton. And they say that all skeletons always come out of the closet. Of course they do, because all of these spirits know them. And of course at some point they're going to try and tell someone else them, right? And particularly if they're manipulative or controlling, rather than helping you deal with their emotion, they'll tell someone else them. So why do you want to protect all your skeletons in your closet? Because of an unresolved emotion that you don't want to feel. That's all. That's all it is. Yeah, where's the free will there, though? If they go and tell somebody else, where's the free will for this person? The free will is I'm allowed to feel an emotion in you, and I'm allowed to go and tell this person over here. You realise that, you know, Carol's got this emotion where she over nurtures people. I call it. And Carol, totally she's, in, got free will. she's totally in denial about it. I'm allowed, I'm allowed to say those things. I have free will, don't I? I'm allowed to say those things. I've got to look sincerely at why I'm saying those things to class. You know, like, what's my purpose? Now, if my purpose is to help him through a personal truth, then that's a loving purpose. Here's a good example. Here, talk to this lady. She's feeling the same feeling you're feeling. You might be able to connect or whatever, you see? That's my purpose. If my purpose is just to make you feel bad, mm -hmm. then straight away my intention has broken a law of God anyway. Mm -hmm. and straight away there's a law of compensation effect on my soul if my intention was bad. So look at your intention of doing that. What's your intention? But in the end, yes, actually every single thing in your soul, every single, th single thing you have done, every single thing you're ashamed of, there are literally hundreds of people who know about it. And when you pass in the spirit, this is one very confronting issue that most people have when they pass. They realise, hang on a sec, all my emotions are naked. <laughs> and every single thing I've ever done is naked to every single person around me. You imagine that. If you've got issues of shame, what's going to come up straight away? Lots of shame. Why not do it now? Get over that now. <coughs> Get into this space now where you're totally open, totally free, totally able to be yourself without reservation, totally able to talk about anything you want, right? Without being worried or keep, you know, having to worry about what other people are thinking or feeling about it all. Why not get into that space now? When you pass, you're going to breeze through it. You're just going to breeze through it. Say, oh, this is breeze, this is fantastic. I don't have to work anymore, I don't have to, you know, do, well, you do work at a different time, but, you know, I don't have to, you know, make meals anymore, I don't have to care for this anymore, and I've got this total freedom, and not only that, all of these emotions are gone from me and I just feel fantastic. Mm. Why not be in that place in now? Me, that brings up in me a deep feeling of gratitude for you, that the information that you're taking the time to share, me personally and the rest of the group, allows me to take the time to not avoid that shame you were just talking about that, that, that particular issue, although that really yep. deeply affected me. Yeah. But, you know, you're, I'm saying thank you. Thank you. Because I get a chance now to resolve my stuff. <laughs> time. There's time to resolve yeah. my stuff. Yeah. And that's, a, that's, that's the beauty of all of this. If you're brave enough, to do all of this now, that you're just going to have a free existence now. Like, you know, very shortly in this life, physical life, imagine that, just having a free existence even now. And then when you pass, not having to deal with all this crap the majority of people have to deal with when they pass. You know, when, when the Karen's finished typing the post-mortem journal, right, we'll send it out because the first six or seven chapters in that, he's just, you know, Lawrence of Arabia is just dealing with one emotion after another emotion after another emotion after another emotion and, and he's just uh, like constantly overwhelmed by this process of emotional awakening and, and you won't have to experience any of that because you've already experienced it now and you'll be in this space where you're already emotionally awakened and it's a beautiful space to live in. You don't have to feel it. You don't have to feel constrained by anything. The truth is just freedom. It's beautiful. Okay? When you read what he wrote in the journal, though, 
what I uh, couldn't help feeling was, I mean, he, he had no concept of the divine love path yeah. and the, the tiny amounts of gain that he made over years and years of effort. Yeah. You think, wow, how fortunate to, to actually nice. know about that yeah. before you ever get into yeah. those levels where, you know, just, just the tiniest improvement in, in, in his consciousness took him so much effort and so much pain and he wasn't even within the universe of knowing about divine love no. or anything like that. No, that's right. So it's, it's really beautiful to know these secrets really, right? Because they, they don't have to be secrets anymore. Like they've never, they've never God's purpose to, for these to be secrets. But they are, have become secrets because everyone wants to stay away from truth. Right? So if you come to love truth, what happens is that all of these emotions will just flow, you'll get into this state of bliss, eventually you'll get in the state of one moment with God, it might take a few years, it might, you know, it might take five, next <coughs> five years of your life dealing with emotions. In that process you're expanding your soul, you're getting to know yourself, you're getting to know everyone around you truthfully. Everyone around you, every single interaction becomes truthful. Every single interaction, there's no lying that's going on, there's no disharmony going on. And then, and then as that building and building, you get into the state of a one moment where now you're in bliss and everyone around you will notice you're in bliss. And they'll say, what do you got <laughs> that I haven't got? Right? And they'll just be attracted to you because of that thing that, that has now entered you to the point of the one with God. And they'll be just drawn to you because of that. Right? That's what's ahead of all of you. This, this beautiful place of truth and love is ahead of you if you're brave enough to confront the emotions that are involved with accepting truth yeah, and accepting God's truth. Yeah. Now, is this just a, a gradual um, a sort of concept between where we are and where we hope to be? Is it somewhere on that upper scale that you can say we are in that bliss or do you have to be right at the top? And if so, are there many, if any, people on earth living that life now? There's no one on earth living the life of of at one with God mm. right now. No. Very shortly there will be. Mm -hmm. right? And many of you won't take very long. You, you know, at the moment you're thinking it's long, long way, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Many of you will not take very long to actually enter that state. Remember, there's the spheres, right? Of mm -hmm. the spirit world. Remember that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the seventh sphere transition. So the seventh sphere is the transition into the eighth sphere, and that's when you're at one. Mm -hmm. You can reach that condition here on earth right now by doing these processes of feeling your emotions, experiencing the truth, feeling God's truth into you and being open and completely vulnerable <coughs> to all of your emotions. Right? You can get to that state within a very, very short period of time. Right? Spirits do it in the space of, like, once you're <coughs> dedicated to it all, do it in the space of our time in a few months, or six months, or twelve months. Bearing in mind, of course, there's no time there from their perspective, right? They're immersed in the emotion. If you decide to immerse yourself in your emotion, you can be in this place of one minute. Now, what, what happened with Ramtha? Well, Ramtha was in the sixth sphere for 35,000 years, and then made the transition into a one minute over a period of Earth time in a few minutes. In terms of his timing, he went through lots of emotions right, to make that transition. Lots of emotions of self-reliance had to be lost and God-reliance had to be taken on board. So he actually went back to the third sphere and experienced emotions there and experienced emotions in the fifth that he'd missed and then progressed into the seventh and into a one minute. But in terms of our time, it took a few minutes. Right? Mm. Was that person you spoke about Lobsen, Grandpa? Or was that no, Ramtha, who JZ Knight's channeling. Oh. Yeah. Just to get a more accurate perspective, I don't really understand. Um, you're saying you're not at one with God. Um, I'm saying that my condition of injuries prevent me from expressing my love completely, which is the same condition as not being at one with God. But you're saying realistically that people in this room can achieve it before you do? Uh, realistically, all of you could achieve it before I do. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I've got, I've had like 2,000 years of all these memories piped down through some pretty severe emotional injuries that I'm now having to work through and I have been working through for 12 years. Right? But that's not going to take you 12 years. But the first person to do anything 
takes a long time. Huh? <laughs> it's normally the case. Yeah. Right? Roger Bannister. Now, in my in my case, I'm the first person to experience reincarnation to get in, to get back into that condition. Right? So I'll be the first person to do that. But you can be the first person from your first, from a condition of sin and error to reach your one with God. But why now would you want to be the first person anyway? Who cares about that? <laughs> in the end, all we can care about is feel our emotions, connect with God, do it all sincerely, and you'll, you'll get there quite rapidly. Right. So what I'm saying is all this is very possible for you. It's not, I'm not presenting a utopian dream here, although many people think I am. Right? I'm presenting reality, and, and, and if you don't believe it in the end, I'm hoping that in the end I'll get to the point where I can prove it to you. Right? But in the end, you could choose to decide to do it all now, if you wanted to. Because in the end, I'm just encouraging you to be real. Angie, I thought you um, said at the other lecture that you took on the emotions of your parents in this lifetime to experience what it's like to go through this heavy, heavy emotions so yeah. that they understand us. Yeah. But what I'm hearing you say now is that are they, are, were emotions in you from the first century that were unresolved? No. No, what, what, I, what, what I'm saying now is consistent with what I said then, and that is that all of the experiences of my 2,000 years of life have been piped through, the memories of them have been piped through my parents' emotions. What do you mean by piped through? Well, basically, I'm experiencing now all of these experiences that I remember through the emotional injuries of my parents that I, that I had in this life, and I'm having to resolve all of them all emotionally as those memories come to me. Each one triggers new emotions in me, and I've got to experience them and release them. So they were your injuries. They were, you haven't just taken this on for the exercise of it. Oh no, no. <laughs> but, but they're not my injuries from two thousand years, because I didn't have any. They are the injuries. They are all of my memories, piped through the emotions of my parents this time. So you now experience them emotionally. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. In the first century, um, when I was like twenty, and um, I had an experience where a woman tried to have sex with me and, and I rejected her. She went home and told her father and her brothers and they beat me nearly to death. That was one of my experiences from the first century. Now at the time, it didn't affect me very much at all emotionally. It affected me a lot physically and it took me five years physically to recover from it. But emotionally, it didn't affect me very much at all. Right? But what's happened is, my father has some big mistrust of women emotions. Right? Current my current father. Mm. So when I incarnate now into this life, I'm absorbing all this mistrust of women emotions. And guess what comes up? This memory pops up of this mm. woman who, <coughs> who basically lied about what had happened. Is that because you didn't deal with it back then? Or no, no, no. It's, it's just the memory just being passed through the emotional filter of my father this life. Mm. And so now, the feeling that I have about that event is that I can't trust women. Does that make sense? And I had to release that emotion. I, I, I had a feeling in my heart that women were liars. Right? And, and when a woman lies, you can die from it. That's the feeling I had that I had to deal with. Right? And so, you know, any woman who lied, I just, like, I, and of course I attract women who lie, <laughs> which is my attraction, right? Um, so, yeah, I attracted quite a number of women into my life, including my own mother, who. Who, who would lie, you know, to protect themselves, but often cause damage to others. So, so what often happens is that, and this is what happens at reincarnation, is all of these emotional, these memories, which are not emotions in that 2,000 year experience, become emotions through the filter of the emotional injuries that you get on reincarnation. So is that just helping you to gain more experience and well, I could have chosen a parent who is close to having no emotional injuries. I could have, yes. So I could have actually gone into India somewhere and chosen a third sphere. Like, there are some spirit people on earth, who are in, and, and some women and men who are married, who are in a third sphere-like condition right now. And I could have chose them, which meant I wouldn't have to deal with hardly any of these emotions that I have. But I actually pur purposefully chose the two parents that I chose, mm. but, so that I could go mm. through those emotional experiences. Sorry, but weren't you saying before that it's the parents who choose the child? No, but on reincarnation, it's totally different. Oh, that's the reverse. Yeah, you can do anything you want in reincarnation. 
So on the first incarnation, understand the first incarnation, you, your you parents chose you, right? Because you were totally unconscious of the choice, right? But the moment of individualization, you are now conscious, and now you have free will to do anything you like. And when you reach a 20-second sphere state, you are now fully conscious. You can choose your parents. You can choose who you're going to encounter. <coughs> you can even choose, oh, that parent's got that quality, that parent's got that quality, and I can work through the genetic issues of that, and I can actually choose somebody who makes me look a certain way. That I, you know, I can choose all of that. Did you do that? Yeah. yeah. You know, you've got a bit of Jesus-looking qualities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I don't look as good as I did that. <laughs> The only person. There's 14. There's 14 of you. There must be more than that, though. Because, like, everyone, nearly everyone I know has, like, memories of past lives. And yeah, but we've talked about that in previous mm. groups. Yeah. And that and that is the impression of spirits upon them that are around them that they're actually feeling. And the other thing, too, is, like, I've got knowledge and memories from just totally different experiences that have got nothing to do with being here. So, how would I get that? From spirits who are I giving you. It is. Sorry? I reckon I've been in other places. Well, that's what you want to believe, yeah. I, like I can even remember it so clearly. Like I remember my baby dying when I was in New Zealand and floating off down a river, yep. like someone burning like this forest behind me and stuff. And it's like I was so there. Exactly. Like, it wasn't another spirit. It was can amazing. I can I tell you what? Like the spirit's here with us right now. If you want to know, and talk okay. about it. Yeah. Like the, the issue is, she 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 has a lot of painful experiences from her from her life. Yeah. And she's hanging around you because she feels quite strongly that you and her are very, very similar to each other personality-wise, right? Mm -hmm. And so what, what actually is happening is she's feeling a strong feeling of camaraderie with you. But she also is... One of the reasons why she's giving you these pictures is she wants your friendship. She wants you to feel what she felt. You so follow she me? can clear it? Not just so she can clear it. At the moment, her viewpoint is that it all hurt her too much. But she wants you to commiserate at the moment with her life. Do you okay. follow me? Yeah. So at the moment, her desire is not to actually feel the emotions she felt at the time, but more for you and her to sort of get together and be friends. Okay. And commiserate with each other yeah. about some of the childhood <coughs> emotional experiences. Right? And in her so case... is that healthy or not really? Yeah, very healthy. Because what it does is it triggers your emotions. So when she gave you those pictures, what did you do? Oh, I just felt grief. Yeah, and so this is your unresolved grief being triggered by her giving you those pictures. You mm -hmm. follow me? Yeah. And the key for you now is just to allow yourself to experience that grief and show her how she can experience her grief. Yeah. Because what's locking her up at the moment is she's got all this grief inside of her that she's really strongly... She's actually now wanting to talk to me. But anyway, <laughs> I'm just describing her emotions. Yeah. She's, she's got all this grief inside of her that she is trying to experience, it, it, like that she's that she doesn't know how to deal with yeah. from her earth existence, and it's actually locking her up in her current location in the spirit world. You follow yeah. me? Yeah. And what she does, what and this happens to you all the time. You'll get you'll get spirits around you. Oh, I like you. <laughs> you know, you've got certain feelings and emotions that I've got, and so forth. And I feel like we can be friends and all those kind of things. And they're just trying to resolve their emotional issues, just like you are. And when you attract them, it's a very good thing. Because there's things you need to feel in that attraction as well as themselves. The key is to go into the emotion of it. Right? Yeah. So she's had a very hard... She had a very hard life, obviously. Right? And she feels a lot of grief that she's unwilling to... It's locked in her. Locked in her. I'm saying here because it's across... She can actually look at it and see that it's across her chest area. And, and it's locked in her, and she's not willing to cry about it. She's sort of a, mix, a mixture of angry and tears about it at the moment. Yeah. And you can probably feel what I'm saying now, because yeah. you are quite mediumistic, actually. Mm -hmm. And what, one of the things that's preventing your mediumistic skills is this belief that these are past lives. Okay. Yeah. If you can see everything, everything that's been presented to you as a spirit who's come to talk with you, you'll find that you'll be able to have conversations with them okay, I'll and, that. And, actually, yeah. and actually help you and them work through their emotional issues. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay, so I've entered into the divine truth, and this is real, and I've come to the realisation that I 
perpetuated um, just call them lies. Pain. <laughs> pain. No, the yep. worst pain. Go on. That's gone to others. Yeah, lots of others. Yep. In that truth, you realise the pain that you've perpetuated mm -hmm. on the first person that's gone. What? What? You're in truth. You feel the love. <coughs> you know you've done the wrong thing. How do you fix it? How well, this is another conversation, a topic altogether by itself that I spend a whole day on. Oh. And it's the issue of divine, the laws of for repentance and forgiveness. Now, all of you have heard of God's grace. Yeah? God's grace is God's mercy. Basically, you can think of it as the quality of mercy. What the quality of mercy is, is this desire that God has to demonstrate mercy or to basically rub away, if you like, or take away from you the causes of what you have done or caused other people with pain, right? God wants to do that for you. But God can only do that for you when you are in a state of being repentant for that. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. There's this law that requires repentance. And the reason why it requires repentance is that if there's another law called the law of compensation or the law of karma, if a person is not repentant, then the law of karma is what clears them away of the error. In other words, they sow what they reap. Oh, sorry. They read what they say. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right? And, and so what we need to do is firstly learn that every time that we are not repentant, in other words, every time we get out of the emotion that we're feeling about the things that we've done, and we go into the head about the things we've done, and we justify the things we've done, then the law of attraction and the law of compensation is going to clean us up. <laughs> It'll refine us, shall I call it that. When I say clean it up, like wash you clean, it will refine you. But you don't need to do that long-winded process. It's a long-winded process. You can do this shorter process where you actually f allow yourself to completely feel the emotions of sorrow about what you've done. And when you direct those feelings towards God, God's love comes and enters you. And, and rubs away, if you like, the causes within you that created your desire to do those things. Does that make sense? So it's like a cleansing. It's like a cleansing yeah. process. Yeah. Now, it's real forgiveness. And it's, yeah, God, God's always forgiving. So don't feel that God doesn't forgive you. God forgives you whether you're repentant or not. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. And in fact, God actually requires that you forgive others if they are repentant or not. But that is a different aspect than mercy. Right? Mercy is a totally different situation. So what I've given you is a brief summary of that entire discussion. Yeah? You want to... I, I just wanted to add that I've actually experienced um, that feeling of... It was like when I, um, after being repentant, God put his hand in my hurt and took it all away. Yeah. Yeah. But it required a real deep feeling of sorrow on your behalf, didn't it? And an understanding of the pain that was caused. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, Ajay, just as you're talking about with our kids, you know, I realise the things I've done with my children, you know, some primary things, like I was yep. really rejected in my family, I was a black sheep, the scapegoat. Yeah. And my oldest daughter, I've done that to her. Mm -hmm. And in my emotions, I, I can't understand why I can't really love her. Why, I mean, I do, but you know, why I reject her and think she's not as good as my other daughter. Right, so the causal emotion is in fact an emotion inside of yourself of shame about the quality that you have inside of yourself that she actually mirrors. Yes. Right. Yeah. So what you're actually doing, the reason why you can't connect with her is that you're not allowing this connection with yourself. There's a feeling inside of you, and you, I think you pretty much know what it might be about how you define yourself, that you, she finds, you find that she the mirrors, right? And you can't allow the connection to your own feeling. No, no. And that's what's causing the blockage between you and the daughter. But I feel deeply sorry that I've done that. No, you don't. I don't. No. The reason why you don't feel deeply sorry is because you're unwilling to feel the emotion of unworthiness. In myself. The actual emotion. In myself. See, when you're willing to feel the actual emotion, 
then you will be sorry. Mm -hmm. And that at that moment it can be cleared. Do you follow me? Yeah. Right? See, a lot of times we think we're sorry, but we're not willing to feel the emotion connected mm -hmm. to the truth of the sorrow. I feel sad about it or something. Mm -hmm. I agree, you feel sad about the effects. Yeah, it's a really totally. sad. But you're not addressing the cause. So just really look at the unworthiness that I feel and the shame. Yeah, she is mirroring something to you that you hate within yourself. And you're going to need to come to love that within yourself. Okay. And when you do that emotionally, that is the time you're repentant. Yeah. And when you're repentant, the causes will be removed. Mm -hmm. And ironically, your daughter will change as well. Yeah, I know that. I know she's almost changed when I've changed sometimes. And I think, Always. how can that happen? Yeah. And we'll talk, that's another discussion in itself as well about children. <laughs> but she's so connected with me on some level. Yeah. She's just crying out for my life. Yeah. yeah. So the discussion of, uh, actually, I haven't chosen next week's discussion in Brisbane yet, so I might make it that way. Anyway. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I find it a real fascinating subject. Um, it's, one of, it's one of the laws of divine love. Repentance and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're talking about God's grace and mercy, in other words. And, and it's a beautiful law, actually, that God's created that actually allows you to bypass, if you like, the law of what you sow, you reap. Right? It actually allows you to bypass that by, 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 firstly, you need to connect emotionally to the cause of what's going on inside of you. And it's a beautiful law that God has created that's a part of God's mercy. Yeah. So God has this way in which you know, he, he can remove these deep emotional injuries, but only when you are fully feeling them. And that's what repentance is all about, fully experiencing and feeling those emotions. Yeah. But we're off the topic. So let's... Uh, actually, we're almost finished actually too, so I'm not going to cover all the topics. The last one I'd like to talk about a bit though, before we go. Divine truth is felt, it is emotional. We can intellectualise all day about truth. We can talk about it till the cows come home, right? But unless you start feeling it, until that time occurs, it's all just going to be an, a pointless, in a way, intellectual exercise. Right? Now, unless you're prepared to actually start acting upon and feeling in your heart the emotions of truth and what they confront, then really the, ho the whole point of this discussion is lost. You follow me? The truth is felt emotionally just like error is felt emotionally. So you know when an error leaves you, many of you have already had this experience, when the error leaves you, you have, are, are overwhelmed emotionally, aren't you? And it's a terrible emotion, like it feels painful, right? Well, when the truth enters you, it's often an overwhelming emotion, but it's not painful. It's actually pleasurable. You know, when you cry for joy, that kind of a pleasurable emotion. Right? The truth will enter you emotionally, and the error will leave you emotionally. If the truth hasn't entered you emotionally, you will not change. Right? So let me say something like this, just a simple illustration. When you feel the truth emotionally, that... Every action you take towards an animal has an effect on how the animals treat you and how the animals and react with you. When you understand that truth emotionally, you will change the way you eat. Right? Mm -hmm. You will no longer be able to eat meat. I can guarantee you, it will just be an automatic change in you. Now, until that time, it's really pointless in a way in a lot of ways, it's pointless to intellectually change. But you can do that to trigger the emotion. So, for instance, if you gave up eating meat right now, knowing that down the track you'll give it up anyway, it'll bring up emotions. You know what bring up emotions of, I'm, every meal I eat, I don't feel full. Every meal I eat, I don't feel that nice, comfortable, full feeling, you know, that comes when I eat some meat, right? I feel like something's missing, right? and it will start bringing up the emotions as to why you eat meat. Right? Which are all emotional reasons, actually. Right? But, so you could choose to do that. Or you could choose to contemplate God's truth about animals. Contemplate the truth about how we're treating them. Contemplate the truth. Would you actually 
get right now, if we, if we went outside, would you get a sheep and actually slit its throat and bleed it and then cut it up and cook it right now? Would you do that? No. So why are you asking another person to do it for you? Why are you doing that? Do you think that's fair? No. Really? Is it fair? Is it is an honest thing to do? Now, if you start to... It the truth a bit more. Sorry? Yeah, it disguises the truth a bit more. That's why we do it. But the truth, the truth is that once you start feeling that, when you feel that in your heart, you won't be able to eat another piece of meat again when you feel that. And if you're not feeling it, then you've got to ask the question, of what emotion inside of you causes you to not feel that? Does that make sense? Now, I'm not saying that all of you have to give up eating meat, am I? What I'm saying is, once you become in harmony with God's truth at the point of abundance, you will not be eating meat, I can guarantee you. Because you will not be able to. <coughs> you will not be able to feel love for animals and at the same time kill them. Or ask other people to kill them for you. Yeah, AJ, I actually went through this process last year intellectually. Yep. Not to eat meat. And I found that it was okay for a while. But then I eventually went back, back to meat. A few weeks ago you said... Um, you know, the, the, do it for the, you know, for the love of the animal, and that, that was it. I was just, oh, yeah, I can't do that. Yeah. And I was, I was away for work and a bit of a function. They had, you know, they was it meat like they do? Well, uh, they, they did, and I had, had a little bit, a few prawns actually. Yeah. And as I, I actually looked at each prawn, oh. and I, I did eat a couple, but I felt really, really guilty about it. Yeah. And from then I was. You can't do it now. Mm. Yeah. The feeling of pain. Because it's that emotional... Yeah. See, when you get into a state of truth, what will happen is every time you're out of that state, you'll feel pain. Mm. Uh, and the truth is, you're actually feeling pain right now when you're out of a state of truth, but you're just not sensitive to it. Mm. You just become more sensitive to it as your soul opens. Yeah. AJ, how does this uh, affect me then? What, what action can I take? I run a small property with cows which are used for breeding velas. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, it's just the natural state of the cycle of the business that you send the veilers off to the beef to market. The beef market. Yeah. And I'm not going to tell you what to do. Mm. But is it, it's is because it, you need to allow country, yourself, though. but you need to allow yourself to feel your emotions. See, at mm. the moment you're willing to, you're willing to actually go through this process yes, <coughs> for a financial reason. Mm. Yeah, sort of. Mm. Well, it is for a financial reason. Mm. Because why else would you be doing? Yeah, no, well, yeah. See, there's an emotion tied in yeah. there. So. Well, I've always had a very big emotional contact with my cows anyway. Yeah. I bore my head off when I've got apart with yeah. the old ones and I've foolishly given names to instead of numbers and all this no, sort of thing. No, you haven't been foolish. No, well, I don't think so. I really <laughs> have a, a liaison with my yeah. animals. And yeah. I love, I can't bear anybody to come and So how in your heart do you justify I don't other? know. I've just put up with that for years. So there's something going on emotionally. Yeah, it is. It's always that? upset me a lot. So let yourself feel that emotion now, and then you will know what to do. So I'm not tell, I'm like, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't want to tell you what to do. What I'm saying is, feel your emotion. You will know what to do. If you really feel your emotion. If you sit down and look at how they made Kentucky Fried Chicken, Right? On, on the net there is a site dedicated to that entire subject. Right? And if you looked at it sincerely, you would never be able to eat a chicken again. Mm. What's it called? The site? I can't remember the site. Did you ah. Google it? And yeah. I actually did that when I was living in New Zealand. My daughter brought home a book about how they killed the chickens for yep. the product. And I made myself read this book and I was so upset. And I, I remember I had to go and pick the kids up somewhere. I was bawling my eyes out in the car and yeah. I, I really felt a really deep, but I've got, I have gone back. Well, so you I, haven't released the... But I really felt at the time I was like, I, yeah, I obviously haven't, but yeah. You haven't? There's two things we need to do when we're accepting truth, remember? We need to release the error. So what's the error? The error is all the grief that I feel about guilt and whatever that I've done all that in the past. There's the error. I also need to accept the truth. What's the truth? Right? And see, a lot of times if your conduct doesn't change, you're not doing one of those two things. You're either not releasing the error, or you're yet to accept the divine truth. One of the two is happening still. Yeah? So what I need to do is ask myself, alright, 
you know, I went through all of that terrible emotional experience, but now I've gone back to doing it. So there must be more emotion in there for me, or something that I'm not, not accepting from God that enters me yet, to cause me to redo that. Now, by the way, I brought up this subject of me, not to discuss the subject of me, but to actually focus on, focus you on, how the truth will affect your life emotionally. When you realise things emotionally, you will change, and you will change permanently. You won't ever be able to go back. And when you try to go back even, because you get resentful sometimes, or you feel, you know, the feeling of rebellion that pops up occasionally, right? And you try to go back, you'll find it so painful that you can't do it again. That's how it works. I want to share a story. You know, my unit that I haven't rented yet. Yeah. And then we had a woman rent it. But when I met with her to sign the paperwork, she had to get a bond loan. And I noticed that her husband, her partner's name wasn't on the thing. And she said, no, that's because I'm not telling the government that he's living with me because I'm on a pension mm. and I'll lose too much of the pension. I went, well, that's her lie. I'm not going to have anything to do with that. So yeah. I her up. And I drove away. I got halfway home and I just started feeling sick. Yeah. And I got all this tension. And I phoned her up again and said, look, we have to talk again. And I had to, I could have just signed her up for six months and got a whole heap of rent. Yeah. But I couldn't do it. Yeah. So I had to just say, look, I can't do it. I, said, yeah. I just can't do it. I said, you're not going to like what I'm going to say. But I just can't do it. Yeah. And so what you were doing as you were going through that emotion, what emotion was being triggered was this willingness to prostitute your truth yeah, for, money. for the sake of money. Yeah. And, and honestly, this is what we do a lot, right? If we're honest with ourselves, we actually prostitute ourselves a lot, you know. And, and I feel very, like I feel a lot of uh, feelings towards pe people who are prostitutes because they are condemned for their actions. And yet the majority of us in our life are doing it constantly every day and nobody makes comment. Right? They're just being open about it. Right? They're selling themselves for money. We sell ourselves for money all the time and everybody thinks it's normal. Right? There's a lot of condemnation there, isn't it? It's there? funny that the same week I find the um, DVD called Whore yeah. from the video shop, which is basically a... Um, Interesting law of attraction. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a, a, uh, interviews of uh, prostitutes. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. There you go. Have to go back. <laughs> yeah, so the whole attitude of prostituting yourself yeah. is actually one that's deeply embedded in society. Mm -hmm. And it's all to do with our unwillingness to face the truth and our willingness to use money as our God guiding all of our other actions, yeah. right? or our willingness to have friendship with our God guiding all of our other actions, or whatever the emotion is that we're trying to prevent ourselves from feeling. Just on that word prostitute, AJ, do you know what the original meaning of the word was? No. A woman who has come into her own power. Ah, okay. It was only the church in about the 4th century AD who converted, converted it to, to a... Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> So you were preparing a meal and I couldn't, cut, the couldn't chicken cut it up. Get the butcher to cut the chicken up. Yeah. And now I'm starting to find this, uh, this sort of simply smell cook, feeling. It's like I don't know how else to cook. So it's easier to go with the flow yeah. of these meals that I know. Of. So listen to your soul. See, oftentimes what we're doing is not listening to our soul at all. Right? Your soul knows a lot of divine truth. You just don't accept it. That's all. And, and your soul is telling you almost on a daily basis a lot of times, like, how many of you like the smell of meat? Not cooked meat, I mean raw meat. How many of you like the smell? Like, your soul is telling you already, right? How many of you would like to cut a uh, chook's head off? You, you know, feel the emotion. Would you, would you really like that? Do you, you like something you would enjoy? Um, so why are you doing it or getting other people to do it? Sometimes it's just the fear of change. Yeah, you know, doing some stepping outside your little square and... But honestly, all of us, like, one of the things I said about truth is it's going to require change of you constantly. So if you're fearing change, that's an emotion. Deal with that emotion. You're going to change. Whether you like it or not, actually. <laughs> the truth is you're going to change, right? A lot, a lot of people, like, I'm a builder and, that, and um, a lot of people think that you, you need me to, you know, be able to work heavy yeah. and all that. Yep. But, um, Angel and I gave up meat 18 months ago, yep. and and I've never bothered in work or 
Yeah. I'm just as um, good, well, probably better now. Yeah. And they say, oh, what are you going to do for protein and all that? But you can survive quite well. And all the vegetarian meals are much more tasty than the... Yeah, once you know how to cook, meals. it's a lovely... When Ange and I go to a restaurant and stuff like that, you can just smell fish or meat or whatever come out. <laughs> yeah. We haven't even go there anymore. Yeah, yeah. Some good restaurants down at Malolabar, by the way, vegetarian. <laughs> Raw energy is really good, I enjoy it there. And, and uh, last night we were at the walk on the wild side. And, and, uh, and Ban is a yummy meal, right? Yummy meal. So, some good vegetarians. Oh, it's behind, how would you describe it? It's like, you know the Esplanade? You come in, you know, from the main highway. Yeah, on the Brisbane Road, get to the Esplanade. If you go around that way, around the first building, right around on the side is Walk on the Old Side. Right? Yeah. Second corner. Yeah. <laughs> giving you. <laughs> feel, feel funny giving you food advice. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to finish, really. It's quarter to six. Uh, AJ, can I just mention? And no, I've just got to mention some things. Um, yesterday I mentioned that we'll be doing some intensive, more intensive uh, sort of help for people who really want to connect with their emotions. And we have chosen a weekend, a weekend where it will be single days only, so there will be a different group Saturday and a different group Sunday. And, and it will be uh, uh, Saturday, I think it's the 20th of September, and Sunday the 21st of September. And it will be at Carol's lovely location. But I want to come up and visit the location and just make sure of things first, so I'll give out more details. So I was hoping to catch up with you Friday next and, uh, and just... Um, and just have a chat with you about it all. And what I want to do is, if you could put your name, I think you've got a list there where you put your name down for it. Um, I had a request that you fully choosing your emotions before you come, and fully choosing or being aware of wanting to live in truth, right? So if you're finding a resistance to truth, then perhaps it's not a wise thing at this moment to come. Now, um, what I would like to do, though, is have a group meeting with all the ones who have put their names down, right? because I want to feel whether you're fully choosing truth or not, before you come. All right? which, will save, which will save any embarrassments about people leaving during the course, because I feel they're not in truth, right? and not wanting to be. So um, I'll have to just uh, organise a time when we can all get together, but that, we can do all of this and organise all this through emails over the coming month. All right? And it will be focused on helping you connect with your emotional baggage and experiencing it. And what we will be doing, and just a general sort of feeling about it, is that we'll be having group discussions and group activities, but every time a person gets into their emotion, we will probably be separating the person and dealing with their emotion so that they can fully deal with that emotion there and then. Right? So we don't want anybody putting off their emotions till later. We're going to just immerse ourselves in the emotions. So if you're not prepared to do that, don't put your name down. All right? Now, if you are prepared to do that, put your name down and I'll, I'll meet. We will organise a group and there will be other details come out from that. Um, it will probably start 10 a.m. each morning, go to about 5 in the afternoon each day uh, on those two days. So that's the general details of that. Was there anything else you wanted to add, Peter? I was really... Oh, I wanted to mention that um, one of Adam's, my son Adam's friends uh, has spent the last one and a half years making an incredible DVD along the lines of what you were talking about. And he, it's, called, it's kind of like along the lines of the secret in terms of quality, yeah. but it's all about um, the choices that people make about their health and eating. It's called Food Matters. If they have a look at the website, uh, it's called foodmatters.tv. And I, I promised I'd mention it to the group because it, it really is uh, an outstanding piece of work. And everyone, everyone, I think, would really benefit from... And you can watch it on, online or you can order the, the DVDs um, through myself or off the, off the net. And it's, you know, it's very, very good and, and uh, it addresses the, the whole sickness and health industry and, and the importance of uh, choosing wisely the food you eat. Yeah, can I just say though that many of you will want to resolve your physical uh, 
you know, illnesses and, and so forth, with physical solutions. Many of us still want to do that. And I'm saying to you, and I've been saying to you consistently now for the whole time we've known each other, that all of your physical problems are a result of emotional injuries, right? including the choices you make in your food. It's all based on emotional injuries too. Many of you women will know, every time period comes along, right? Where does chocolate go? Yeah. No. no, I skip the chocolate, I go to beer and smirnoff. Oh, okay, no worries. <laughs> but there's, there's emotions attached, right? There's emotions attached to all of those experiences. So, so if you can always keep reminding yourself that sure, you can change your life physically, but if you never address the emotions, the underlying cause will never be addressed. Alright? So, if the, if the underlying cause is never addressed, then the problem will never permanently <coughs> disappear. Right? I just want to add to that whole subject because my experience is coming from the reverse of what probably what most people are experiencing. Um, I've already, for about 23 years, I went through being vegetarian and vegan for most of that time. Yeah. And I'm noticing a lot of emotion. <laughs> and um, it was uh, about seven or eight years ago that um, a lot of changes physically to where I felt my health was going down. Yeah. And through, and it was mostly intellectual and reasoning and yeah. looking at all the evidence and all that, so I started um, eating more protein, uh, like raw, raw dairy and yeah. raw eggs and things like that yeah. that were organic and all that. Yeah. And um, I noticed a lot of positive changes, Thanks, you know. Yeah. But, um, and you're introducing the whole idea of the emotional cause, because I'm always going for a physical, rational um, explanation yeah. for illnesses or disharmony. Yeah. So, um, and the questions that I've ha I've felt, I haven't had attraction to eating um, meat. Um, intellectually, I would go, okay, well, if it was ethically raised, um, you know, in a loving environment, um, and but it it always came down to, well, am I willing to take that animal's life yeah. and consume it? And yeah. I thought, well, until uh, and then I I look at cultures where that was part of their day-to-day -day living. Yeah. I thought, well, if I was brought up in that environment, then it would, it would be just, uh, yeah. you know, part of the day-to-day -day life, and yeah. there wouldn't be any problem with it. Yeah. So there's some, some issues there that I'm looked at. Look um, yeah. And coming back to that question of what do I feel in my heart, and um, uh, I... There's a there's question, so there's a lot lot to, to resolve. But it's coming from the from the different yeah. from from the vegan vegetarian point of view. Yeah. Coming back to eating. Some of you food. have actually eaten vegan vegetarian just on this subject, and actually found your health deteriorate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah. The reason why is because you did not deal with the emotions mm -hmm. as to what was creating your health deterioration. Mm -hmm. right? That's the whole reason why. Do I do I look pretty healthy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So, See, what's wrong with eating eggs and milk? True. I'm sure that's not hurting the animal, is it? Well, I suppose it depends on the situation, but... If they're ethically grown, which is not like if they're... Mm -hmm. if they're not grown. fertile anyway, so they're not going to develop into chicks. You know, it's very hard to... It's very hard. <laughs> These questions are for you to resolve, in the end, mm -hmm. right? Because you need to let yourself feel your emotions, right? You'll get to a stage, I know, where you'll get to what stages you'll get to in your progression, mm -hmm. where what and what you will do but only when you feel your emotions. What I'm encouraging you to do is to feel your emotions and let that guide your decisions right now. And if it, and if it guides them in error, you'll get more pain. If it guides them in truth, you'll get, you'll become more, you know, your whole body will, will right itself. I've got to stop everybody's questions. I just want to ask you where no, you no, I've got, no, I've got to stop everyone's questions. It's quarter to 20, 10 to 6. And, and I want to stop, but I know you've all got questions and I could keep answering them. Also, I want to, this afternoon, not answer your questions afterwards, alright? The, the reason why I'm feeling this at the moment is because I've already just given you five hours straight of my time. 
and, and, and that's my love for you. And I realise many of you could keep asking and keep asking, have all these personal things. <coughs> but go back to the basic truths that we've been learning. Truth, love, emotion. Go back to that and you will be able to answer almost every one of your own questions. Hey, James. So go back to that. In just the next bit you mentioned when you say you will not